like to welcome you all to the first uh, sit back seminar of 2023. Uh, as many of you are probably aware, each month MTRI hosts a different seminar on biodiversity and conservation related topics. So my name is Chad Simmons and I am an ecologist here at the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute. Uh, but before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that MTRI is in and we are meeting from Gespoik, one of the seven districts of Mi'kmaq, homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. We acknowledge the treaties of peace and friendship, and we wanna thank the Mi'kmaq people in their generosity uh, for sharing their homeland with us. So for anyone unaware, MTRI is a research-based nonprofit, and we are nestled in the heart of Southwest Nova Scotia, just down the road from Kejimakujik National Park and National Historic Site, and nestled within the Southwest Nova Scotia Biosphere Reserve. Our mission is to promote, conserve, and sustain biodiversity in Gaspoik, as well as beyond. So tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce Emily Cormier. Cormier, sorry. Uh, Emily is a master's student at Dalhousie University. And so next, I'm going to hand the seminar over to her. But I would just like to remind everyone to please keep your mics muted. And if you have any questions during the seminar, you can type them into the chat window or wait until the end uh, of the presentation when we'll have a live question and answer period. So with that, Emily, if you'd like to start. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you all for being here. And I'm really excited to present a bit of my master's thesis re research with you all. Um, so I'll share my screen. So I am a master's candidate at Dalhousie University, so I'm currently completing my master's work. And this talk, I'm going to focus on using satellite imagery to monitor a young lemon shark nursery. And this is going to be looking at specifically their habitat. So at first, I'm going to talk a bit about what are elasmobranchs. Then I'll speak on what is elasmobranch habitat. Then I'll switch gears to talking about space technology. And then I'll talk a bit about my master's thesis and how you can use space technology to help, uh, help shark species and elasmobranchs. So what are elasmobranchs? This is a scientific name and it can be broken into two parts. So we have elasmo, which equals plate. So this is the uh, Latin name for the elasmobranchs and then branch, which means gill. So these are gill plate species. So they're actually in the group under the group of fish. But this group of elasmobranchs can be broken into two parties in particular. So you have the sharks and then you have the rays. And so these all have these very visible gills. But then who are elasmobranchs in a way? So you may have seen uh, a lot of this elasmobranch in particular, the great white shark or the white shark. And they're very famous and popular, especially for appearances in movies. And they also exist off the coast of Nova Scotia, which is why you may hear more about them in the media. But in reality, there's actually a huge diversity of shark and ray species. And this ranges from um, pure ray looking uh, species like the stingray. And then you also have other species like the um, guitar fish, which you see in the middle, which is kind of a blend between a shark and a ray. And these species exist in a huge variety of habitats and they all have a variety of adaptations to be able to live where they do. So now I'll, I wanna talk a bit about these shark superpowers. So what's exciting about these species and why am I most interested in studying sharks? So the first shark species I wanna highlight is the great hammerhead. And you may have seen images of these online as well because they are a very popular shark and they're amazing to photograph in these blue clear waters. And so these sharks actually have super senses. And so they're huge. Their large uh, head is actually full of tiny, tiny dots called ampullae of Lorenzini. And what these dots do is they can actually sense electrical magnetic impulses in the sand and in the water itself. So these species particularly feed on stingrays and other rays that like to bury themselves in the sand. So they use their head to actually sense the magnetic impulses or the electrical impulses and then track down these species in order to hunt properly. Then we have another really amazing looking shark with a huge long tail. And this is the thresher shark, which actually exists off the coast of Nova, Nova Scotia, but can be quite rare. 
And so this shark uses a tail whip maneuver to actually stun groups of fish in order to be able to catch them more easily. And you can see that with its huge tail, it'd be really effective at this. Next, we have another Nova Scotia species, the spiny dogfish. And these guys are really cool, really amazing because they can dive up to 4,000 feet deep, which is the depth of two CN towers stacked on top of each other. And so these uh, fish or these sharks have been able to withstand extremely high pressure in these deep oceans. We also have species that are very different in size, like the whale shark. And so one of the reasons this is called a whale shark, as you might imagine, is because it's such a large shark. But also this shark feeds on very tiny, tiny plankton or krill. And it does this by opening its mouth, swimming through water and eating a lot of water all at once and then flushing it out through its gills. So it only gets those nutrients. And so these individuals can actually grow to up to 20 meters long, even with just eating these small organisms, which is about the size of one and a half school buses. So quite impressive to see if you see them in the water. And then finally, we have the sawfish or the saw shark. And this in this image is the saw fish. And these guys have a long, almost saw looking appendage on the front of their face. And they'll use this to attack their prey, but they also have a many of these sensory organs similar to the um, hammerhead shark. And so they use this to find their prey in the sand as well. So unfortunately, although these species are diverse and they've had a variety of adaptations that have existed on Earth, uh, in some cases for longer than trees themselves, they are now, many of them, at risk. And so of the 1,000 shark and ray species, 494 of these are coastal, so they're more in contact with potentially being um, uh, harmed by human impacts. So of the 495, 494 species, 25% of them are threatened with extinction, and that's 124 total. But on top of that, there are 35% of these species that are missing data or are lacking data. And this makes it really difficult for managers to be able to predict how to protect the species properly. And so many of these threats can be attributed to overfishing, but then additionally to trophy fishing. So if someone's trying to catch a large shark, um, sometimes when those sharks are released, the stress can be too much and then they won't be able to survive despite being released with seemingly no injuries. These sharks are also prone to bycatch. So in other uh, fisheries like tuna, they can be caught on uh, large, in large nets or on long lining as well. But habitat destruction can also contribute to these species because they have specific habitats that they like to reside in or where they're able to more easily find food. So when I say habitat, I mean the natural home or environment of an animal, plant, or another organism. Oops, there we go. So these habitats are used for feedings. There's specific uh, organisms that they want to eat in these habitats. They're also used for uh, breeding, and then they're additionally used for nursery areas, so where the young sharks will exist for longer periods of time. And so it's important to protect this critical habitat in order to allow some of these populations to rebound, but also to provide refuges for them to thrive. So on the right, I have an image of one habitat that's really important to elasmobranchs. And this is a seagrass habitat. So these stingrays here will often find their prey in seagrass, but then also other species like uh, the fish and the, the clams will find uh, residency in the seagrass because it has other microbes that they're able to feed on. There's also mangrove habitats, which can be really important to lemon sharks and other juvenile shark species because they have this kind of intertwining branches under the water that allow them to find protection from the larger shark species or other species that might want to feed on them when they're most vulnerable. And there's also, again, more prey available in these mangroves. So in my project, I'm focusing on nursery areas in particular. So for a nursery area to be labeled a nursery area, it means that the sharks are more commonly encountered in this area than others, especially the juveniles. The sharks have a tendency to remain or return for extended periods. And then this area or habitat is repeatedly used across years. And in some cases, these sharks can be phylopatric to these nursery areas. So that means that they have a tendency to stay or return to a specific area. And in some cases, this also means that 
somewhat similar to, you may have heard of turtles laying there or being born at one beach and coming back to lay their eggs at that beach. Well, that's also been seen with sharks who will be born in a specific nursery and the mothers will actually come back to have their young in that same nursery area. So an incredibly important place for these sharks and important to protect for them as well. So now I'm gonna tell you a bit about my study area, which is Bimini, the Bahamas. So it's adjacent to the Gulf Stream, which is this deep, deep water channel, which creates, which means that Bimini becomes kind of a refuge as a shallow tidal island ecosystem. To give you reference, it's about 85 kilometers east of Miami, so very much in reach of really dense human populations and potential um, human impacts. And on this island, there is the Bimini Biological Field Station Foundation, who I'm collaborating with, and they have collected data on shark species and other lazobranchs for about two decades um, since the early 1990s. So this island is specifically a lemon shark nursery. So the lemon sharks, which I was talking a bit about before, are really, um, they really find refuge in these mangrove areas and also the shallow seagrass to find prey. And so over the first few years of their life, up to one to five years, they'll actually reside in specific nursery areas. And these can be broken down even into distinct sections of the island. So you have North Sound, Sharkland, and South Bimini. And there have been studies that have shown that these juvenile sharks will actually return to those specific nurseries and reside in those areas. So they won't even really travel between those as much. And these lemon sharks, like I was speaking a bit about before, they have actually done studies where they have tagged uh, one individual baby shark and that shark has returned as a mother to give birth later in life. So it's a really special area for these species. But unfortunately, like many places around the world, there's a lot of habitat degradation um, through human impacts. And so in Bimini specifically, there was dredging for a boating channel in the early 2000s, and then removal of mangroves and for development in 2005. So that's the red area of the map here. And all of this destruction was mostly for, well, it was almost solely for um, development by large corporations to be able to create um, resorts and um, rental properties for people that are coming from Florida because it's so close by. And we can really see this if we look at the satellite imagery. So on the left, I have an image from 1999 where you see almost that pristine habitat, especially in the northern part of the island. And, and that triangle that you see kind of on the west side, closer to the north, that was mostly mangroves. But then if you look in 2011, that area has almost been completely removed of mangroves and they've replaced it with a lot of sand. They've dredged huge channels for the marinas and for boating. And then they've also even created some extra land with the sand. So it's completely changed that area. And if you remember my map from before, this is a really important nursery area for those lemon sharks. So this is what this area looks like now. Um, you can see there's a casino. There's vacation rentals, there's a marina, um, and they even have a new addition, which is the cruise ships that are now coming into Bimini because they've dredged this very large channel. And so you can really get an idea of how small this island is because that cruise ship is almost the width of that western part of the island, so where you see that development. So currently, Luckily, the Commonwealth of the Bahamas is designated as a shark sanctuary since 2011, which is really amazing because this means that these uh, species can't be caught and they're illegal to catch. But then in terms of habitat protection, there hasn't been much ongoing. So in 2001, the eastern Bimini area, so what's circled in yellow, has actually been proposed for an MPA. But this hasn't yet been enacted. And even though the Bahamas National Trust designated as an MPA, so they're a local um, non-governmental organization. There have been no regulations really put in place to protect that habitat, and the development continues to encroach um, on this important habitat for the sharks. Whoops. So with this habitat change, it's really important to document how it's changing to not only guard for future change, but also to assess the impacts of this change on the, on the local shark species. 
So past studies have assessed some of the short-term impacts, but we're still unsure of how this long, how this development will influence these juvenile sharks in the long term and whether it'll impact the survival rates of these very young sharks. So with remote sensing, which is using satellite imagery, we can help to map this habitat over the long term. And then this can be paired with all of that data that's been collected by the Bimini Biological Field, Field Station Foundation since the 1990s. So now I'm going to switch gears and go more into the satellite remote sensing portion of this project and talk a bit about what my research has been showing so far. So satellite remote sensing uses satellites uh, that are in space put out by NASA and the European Space Agency. And these satellites are constantly circling the globe and taking images globally. And they take these images every day. But for one specific area, that one location will have about two Im or one image taken every two weeks. So the satellites work by collecting the reflected light um, back at them and then categorizing that light. So for the human eye, when we look at colors, um, what we're actually seeing is a range of different lights being reflected. And depending on how much of each type of light is reflected back at our eyes, that shows us the color. So the satellite is really well able to collect not only that visible um, color, but also that infrared, which we might not be able to see. On top of that, the satellites have thermal infrared sensors. So these actually allow us to collect temperature of the surface of the water. And this can also help to see how the habitat has changed over time or how temperature might be impacting species. So for my project, I'm using the NASA satellites because they've been running since the early 80s. And so these satellites are multispectral satellites. And what that means is they break light into several large bandwidths. So that can include the red, green, and blue band, but then also some other bands in the near infrared light. And what I'll do with these lights, with this light that's collected by the satellite, is I help to complete this large scale large scale coastal mapping to actually quantify the habitat. So the satellite will collect the image on the left, for example, and you can see that it's quite deep water. And although you can kind of see what habitats they are, you can't necessarily put this into a statistical model or into a scientific analysis. So then what the satellite imagery is able to do when used in a model is take known location of plants, so for example, I would go in and tell it where I know there's seagrass at certain coordinates. It'll take the light that's reflected at those points, and then it uses that exact amount of light to predict where the other um, seagrass habitats might exist. And then you end up with the image on the right, where it's a classified image of vegetated versus non-vegetated habitat. And this study in particular was done in Nova Scotia. So this might seem a bit obscure without actually seeing what the satellite imagery looks like from the beginning. So uh, now I'll take you through an example in Bimini as well. So to start, I get a one satellite image and it'll look like this. So it's showing a huge area, but then I'll take one portion of the actual area that I'm interested in for my study. So now here's the image that I have from um, NASA's satellite and it shows Bimini, but we're gonna zoom in even closer. And so if we zoom into this portion of the island, we can start to see a little bit of pixelation. And so these images are made up of pixels that are about 30 meters by 30 meters in size. And we're using each of these 30 meter by 30 meter squares to map the habitat. So if we take an even closer look, whoops, you can see that each one of these pixels has a varying amount of color coming off of them. And so this image that we're looking at is made up of red, green, and blue light. But in reality, the satellite will have these other bandwidths of light I was talking about, like near infrared, to assess the different types of habitat. So what I would do with this image is tell it that these are the data points that I know. So I know that the dark green is seagrass, the light green is mangrove habitat, and then the gray is developed areas. And then the algorithm or the statistical analysis, analysis that I'm using, <clears throat> excuse me, will take a look at each one of these points. And then it assesses 
how much light is, of each bandwidth is reflected. So for example, this mangrove, you have a lot of green light reflected and a lot of near infrared light reflected by it, but less blue and red light. And for the seagrass, you have a lot of green and a lot of blue light because you're looking through that water column that adds a lot of blue, but you have a lot less near infrared light reflected for it. And then if you look at developed habitats, this is actually a airplane runway, you get more of an even balance of all of the different colors reflected, and that's why we see it as more of a white or lighter um, color. And so what it does is takes now these amounts of different light reflected by each of these pixels and then predicts the habitat based on that light. So now I'll show you a bit of my preliminary results with what I've found through mapping Bimini throughout time. And so just to remind you, this is the land mass of Bimini. So I'm going to start with showing you my land maps that I've been able to create. And this is specifically looking at the mangrove habitats because those are most important to um, the shark species. So I want you to specifically look at this top left corner and that's because that's where most of the development has happened. So this is in 1999 and you can see that there's a lot of mangrove in that one triangle I was talking about and there's some development, but a lot of that um, gray area as well is a bit of sand. So it's not necessarily all just developed land mass. Then we move to 2006 and you see a huge stark change. So not only has a lot of the mangrove been removed, but you also see a lot more barren sand because some of that area has been infilled and to create new land. And then if we move to 2022, you still see a lot of that um, developed area. And then if you even look at the north point of the island, there's a bit more development kind of encroaching onto those mangroves. Now, if we look at the seagrass, the pattern is a bit less clear. So this is in 1999. So the dark green shows the densest seagrass. The light green is the sparser seagrass, and then the beige is the sand. In 2006, you see a shift in how much dense seagrass is available, but it's not necessarily a loss of seagrass, at least what we've seen so far. And then if we look at 2022, again, we have the shift in seagrass, but it seems to be more in this case, which doesn't really make sense with what we know around that image. So one of the, the things with the satellite imagery is that the maps that you make are only as good as the data that you put into these maps. So what I've expected here is that some of this dense seagrass is actually algae. And so, like I said, these are preliminary results. So I'll be going back in and moving these around a bit to uh, try to get more accurate as time goes on. So we're really hoping to pair all of this change in habitat with the uh, survival rates of these lemon sharks Oops. and quantify the long-term change in seagrass and mangroves, watch for future change, and then hopefully determine if these lemon sharks are impacted by the, the habitat change to protect the habitat for a future. So what can we, what can you do to help sharks? You can watch for shark products in your cosmetics. So if it says squalene or squalane, although there are some vegetable alternatives, a lot of the time this is actually shark oil. Um, you can try to consume seafood that's responsibly caught. You can travel responsibly as well. So try to choose sustainable travel properties. And you can support shark conservation organizations like the ones that I've listed on the right. And most importantly, tell your friends about sharks and tell them that they're not all dangerous predators like we've been taught in the media. So thank you. Thank you to all of my contributors as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Emily. What an incredibly interesting project. Uh, does anyone have any questions? It's a good indication you've done an excellent job when there's no <laughs> questions. Okay, well, I have a few actually. Um, yeah. So you mentioned mangroves and the loss of these ecosystems from the island. Could you tell us a little bit more about what a mangrove is? Sure, so 
Can you all still see my screen? I can go back to where I had shown the mangroves. Yep, we can. So a mangrove is a really cool piece of vegetation. I'll just skip back to where I showed those. So it's a really cool piece of vegetation. So they actually have these roots that kind of extend down into the water, but the bulk of the plant will be above the water. So if you can see in this picture, kind of below these little um, lemon sharks, there's a lot of little sprouts coming up. So that's part of their root system. Um, and those are also some of those are new mangroves that are growing. And so th these kind of form like large wetlands, but they'll make a lattice out of all of these roots that are kind of twisted and tangled amongst each other. Um, and they are really important, especially for coastal protection because they create kind of a buffer from large waves or wind. Um, and yeah, so they're just a really incredible species. Awesome. Uh, so Lori says, great job at simplifying and explaining your project for us. Have you been to your study area before? Uh, yeah, luckily I actually started this project because I had interned at the Shark Lab um, for about six months total over a period of a couple of years. So yeah, I have been there. It's it's an amazing island, um, a lot of nature and beauty, and it's very warm and nice. So yeah, and lots of a huge diversity of sharks. Um, that was actually my first time ever seeing a shark was at this island. And yeah, first time I realized they weren't as dangerous as I thought. I've heard apparently more people are killed by falling vending machines than sharks in the world, which is pretty funny. Oh yeah, yep, that's very that's very true. And sharks are much more often killed by humans than the other way around. So, have you seen any indications that the marine protected area is going to become? an actual effective marine protected area? Has there been any changes in policy recently or are they still, it's kind of just like a name? I think it's still pretty much just a name in that area. Um, there haven't been any huge movements forward and because of the, the COVID pandemic, a lot, of, um, a lot of stuff has been put at a standstill for actually trying to push the government to create more of these marine protected areas because being such an isolated island, they were really impacted by um, loss of, of travel and loss of uh, the ability for goods to even be brought into the island. So their their main focus wasn't necessarily creating this marine protected area for the last few years, but. Uh, so Leaf asks, what surprised you most about the habitat analysis that you did? Hmm, that's a good question. So I guess what surprised me the most so far is just how the seagrass seems to be increasing. I really didn't expect that from looking at um, the imagery itself. So I'm hoping, well, not hoping, I mean, it would be good if the seagrass wasn't impacted, but I'm interested to look more into that to see if, uh, yeah, either it's the green algae, like I was saying, so potentially that's actually being predicted as seagrass because it'd be quite green, of course. Um, or if maybe it's warmer temperatures or more ideal conditions. So, so the imagery I was looking at is collected from February, which is usually the minimum um, amount of seagrass because the seagrass will die off seasonally. Um, but maybe if there's warmer temperatures, it's not dying off as much. Yeah, I'm just not sure. So that's that's kind of the most surprising so far. Okay, and David asks, how often are the planned colors entered into the map pixels? So I think he means the classified pixels. Um, he says, I would think algae is a temporary intrusion and would more uh, than suggest man, uh, human involvement. Right, so the, the way that the maps work is I'll take one image, so one image for the one year, and then I'll classify just that one image on its own. So when I'm classifying, it's kind of a snapshot of that exact time and date, um, if that answers your question. So even if the algae is temporary, um, if it was in that image, then it would be classified. It would have to be classified as algae um, in that image. Does that answer your question? 
think so. David will let us know. Uh, okay. So Christina says, awesome job. Uh, in 2006, there was a lot of sparse seagrass changing to dense seagrass and algae. Uh, have these changes negatively or positively impacted the coverage of these nurseries? Or is there enough data yet? Uh, so there's not necessarily enough data to tell um, whether it's impacted the nurseries or not. So there's been a lot of data that's been collected on these juvenile sharks every year. Um, but it also needs to be uh, organized and, and analyzed in order for us to look at um, specifically whether that change in 2006 impacted the nursery area. Because for the most part, the impacts we would be expecting is if this seagrass is changing, it would be changing the availability of habitat for their prey species, which are usually small fish. And then that would in turn impact how well they could feed. So it's I'm not really sure whether the that loss of seagrass uh, will have enough of a change to impact their food and then impact them as well. Uh, next, Lara asks, uh, how many lemon sharks are found in your study area? Oh, how many lemon sharks? That's a good question. I don't think I've actually ever tried to add up the total number of lemon sharks, but I could, I could give a guess, an estimate, probably between it's it's got to be several hundred lemon sharks, but in terms of individuals, because every so because we have one shark will only live there for about five years, so you keep getting constantly new sharks. So there's probably been thousands of baby lemon sharks that have been coming out of here, um, out of of Bimini. But at any one time, I'd say probably a couple hundred. That's my estimate, anyways. That's amazing. What a sight. Yeah. Yeah, they won't all be in one group. Most of them are hiding, but yeah. <laughs> uh, so Lori asks, is satellite imagery work like this uh, being done for other species in your study area? Or is your work and the protection of this area beneficial for other at-risk species there? Um, yeah, for sure. So there have been some, there has been some mapping in the past. Um, they made a map in 2000, but that was also for the lemon sharks. Um, and then they did a more detailed map in 2014 just to categorize habitat in general. But definitely the the habitat and the mapping itself will be useful for other species like the southern stingray. So the image I was showing of these guys, so they're also um, really prevalent at this island and use this habitat as a refuge. And then the hammerhead sharks, like I was showing earlier, um, they also used bimini as a stopover for food. Um, and then there's Tons of other uh, small sharks, like the there's some black tip sharks, um, and some bull sharks and tiger sharks as well have been shown to potentially um, have have young in this area. So, yeah, a lot of different species that would benefit from from protection of the habitat through this mapping. Uh, so Natalie says she may have missed this, but there was large mangrove. And there was a large mangrove area in the upper right bit of the map. Is there any risk to that area becoming developed as well? Right. So I think I didn't talk specifically about that. But if you're referring to, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse. Yeah. So this area here, um, there is some risk of that being developed. So at one point, um, back in the early 2000s when they were first developing they had the bulk of the development happening um they did propose a golf course to be built on that northern part of the island which would be really devastating because you're removing the mangroves but then also potentially putting a lot a lot of new fertilizers nutrients pesticides everything into there um, so there hasn't been like formal development of that but in the imagery i'm looking at which was surprising, also surprising to me. Um, I did see like a bit of encroachment of development onto those mangroves really slowly. So similar to in Canada, it, we have come kind of weird regulations where something for a wetland, for example, will be protected. But if it doesn't meet, meet these uh, wetland characteristics, it's no longer protected. So somebody could go in, secretly destroy part of a wetland, and then it's no longer protected, even if it was a wetland previously. So some of that happens in Bimini as well. So 
they'll destroy some of this mangrove area and then maybe it's not necessarily as protected anymore because it's no longer mangrove and there won't really be penalties for it so i'm that's what i'm most worried about at least uh, as someone who studies wetlands and their development i i sympathize <laughs> Uh, so Devin, this is Leaf's son, uh, asks, what other species are impacted by the development? Um, by the development, it's hard to say because, again, we haven't really quantified that data to actually um, say what's been impacted directly. Um, but definitely the fish species um, in that area of that mangrove, there used to be a lot of bonefish, which are kind of a very large, well, they're I don't know, they're very generic looking fish. It's hard to describe them, just kind of silvery. Um, but there used to be really uh, popular recreational and um, subsistence, subsistence fishing for bonefish um, right near those mangroves. So it's definitely impacted their ability to survive because that would offer a lot of cover for them from the sharks. Uh, so David asks another question. He says reflected light, uh, it changes daily and seasonally and with weather conditions, of course. Uh, does this make it difficult to determine a, a reliable map classification? Definitely, that makes it um, very tricky and that's why we have to be careful with these maps. Um, so I think that with my analysis, we're fairly safe in being able to estimate the amount of coverage of seagrass and the amount of coverage of mangroves over time. but the, with you wouldn't have as much of an ability to say, look at one exact point on the map, say this says it's seagrass, and go to that that exact dot and say, oh, it's definitely 100% seagrass. So there's a bit of uncertainty for the exact um, coordinates, whether those will be the exact habitat. But when you're estimating like overall um, habitat coverage, it's it's fairly accurate for that. And there are ways with satellite imagery as well to remove the interference of something like atmosphere. So one thing I hadn't even thought of really before working on this project was the fact that our atmosphere creates a really large barrier for the light to be able to pass back to the satellite. But luckily enough, there's a lot of different statistical analyses you can do to remove the impact of atmosphere um, and other, other variables that you can still get to the, the truth of what the image really is. Very interesting. Uh, so Lara asks, uh, do the sharks face threats from hurricanes? The areas are fairly shallow. Do the sharks get trapped in these areas with high mortality? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, I don't think there's been any studies specifically in Bimini showing um, that they've been impacted by hurricanes. Uh, actually, Bimini is often quite lucky in that it hasn't been struck really intensely with hurricanes um, in the last little while. But that would be something really cool to look at because they've shown in Florida around um, the estuaries and there, there's a lot of uh, young black, black tip sharks. And the sharks were actually able to feel the pressure change in the shallow waters where they were. And they knew that a hurricane was coming. So just before that, they actually dove deep and went far away from the shore into more um, like waters that wouldn't be as affected by the wind and waves. So it's possible that the lemon sharks here are doing something similar, maybe going out into deeper water before something like that happens. But yeah, we haven't done any studies specifically in Bimini. Uh, and just discussing potentially new studies, David asks, is there any chance to electronically tag a number of sharks per year to verify some of your results? Yes, yeah, so there has actually been a lot of um, shark tagging happening in Bimini. So there's a few different types of tags that they use. There's the acoustic tags so that you have um, fixed points or fixed um, receivers that will collect data from the sharks that swim past them. So they have collected a lot of data um, that way. And someone else is actually looking at those movements, that movement data to see how they use their habitat. Um, but with all the sharks that I'll be, are the data that I'll be working with, they use um, passive integrative transmitters. So they're tiny pill sized tags that they'll put in the shark. And every time you catch the shark, you can scan the shark and it gives you a unique ID codes. So you know exactly which individual that is. 
So that's how we're able to in, um, kind of investigate and estimate the survival rate of these sharks, because you actually know which sharks you're recatching every year and know whether they were like they likely survived. How close do you have to get to be able to pick up the tag? So for the the passive integrated transmitters, you have to be like right next to the shark. So you're usually like you have the scanner right up against them to get the tag. But for the acoustic receivers, usually the so that's another project I'm doing actually is looking at the detection range of those. And that can vary from um, 30 meters to 100 meters distance from the receiver itself. So it really depends on environmental conditions. We do a lot of uh, turtle, turtle and snake monitoring, so it's just hmm. kind of piqued my interest. Oh, very cool, yeah. Uh, so next, and I apologize if I massacre this name, Frank Leisha uh, says that she went to the Shark Lab last summer and they talked about the ongoing oh, awesome. problem uh, of the island becoming more developed to add a golf course. And since the marine protected area is not fully implemented, and being regulated, this can lead to a big chunk of the mangroves in the north being lost, which would be very detrimental to the sharks. And they say it'll be interesting to see how the satellite data will change if those developments go forward. Go ahead. Yeah, definitely. That's really cool. You were able to uh, go down there yourself um, and visit. But yeah, it's it's really shocking when you actually go there in person too, because it's such a small island. Like. Even when I first was interning there, you'd go into the northern lagoon and it would look quite natural. But now you go there and it's kind of like a open wasteland looking area, especially to the west where it's just sand and nothing else. Um, but yeah, it will be interesting. And that's what I like about the satellite imagery is you're able to kind of like continually collect this data. And I hope that after this project, you can continually collect this data to be able to keep track and and like watch for this change in habitat, make sure that they can't do it secretly without anyone knowing about it. Yeah. Uh, so Natalie, thanks you for answering her question. And she says, whoa, very interesting. Awesome, thanks Natalie. And then David says, thank you for the forethought and dedication. And he says, it's unfortunate profit margins often trump conservation, which I think most of us can agree with David. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Leaf says, thank you for your important work and the great presentation. Awesome, thanks. Uh, so I have one last question. Uh, how easy is it to get a hold of this satellite uh, in, um, data? Like, is it something that say a not-for-profit could obtain or do we need like quite hefty research grants? No, it's actually all free online, which is the amazing thing about it. So there's a website called USGS Earth Explorer. And if you go to that site, um, it usually has a directory to show you where to go. Um, and you can go to whatever study area you're interested in and you can search by date and year and they have hundreds of different satellites with hundreds of different sensors on there. Um, the Landsat series is what I'm using for this analysis because it's been going for the longest amount of time, but you can have higher resolution imagery with the uh, Sentinel-2 and it collects imagery at 10 by 10 meter um, pixels. So you can get quite good uh, satellite imagery analysis. That's amazing. And yeah. free is an excellent price. So it's wonderful That's to great. hear. <laughs> yeah, I encourage like other people, if you just want to even look for fun at your own neighborhood, you can see like how it's changed in the past two decades. It's kind of cool. Okay, does anyone have any final questions? Great. Okay. Well, with that, I want to thank you again, Emily, for a wonderful and very interesting uh, presentation and good luck with your with your uh, future work. I hope we can have you again on and see your final results. And uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And uh, I'd also like to thank the Region of Queens for supporting us on our seminar series. Without them, these wouldn't be possible. And as always, you can stay up to date with our seminars by following MTRI on Facebook. And if you'd like to watch tonight's talk again, uh, you can check out our Facebook live stream or visit our YouTube channel. So with that, we hope everyone stays well and we get to see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.